Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to this very special digital version of Comic-Con at Home 2021. I'm Ashley C. Ford, and I'm so excited to be moderating Shudder's panel for Horror Noir. A follow-up to Shudder's acclaimed 2019 documentary, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror, this anthology will highlight six adapted stories of Black horror and stream as a feature film on Shudder and AMC Plus on October 14th. Before we introduce our panelists, let's take a look at a conceptual trailer from the upcoming anthology. It's blood moon tonight. That's when they're gonna feast on the chosen sacrifice. I thought she meant to kill you, to kill my baby. <laughs> How could you sell your soul to the devil like that? This isn't him. This isn't like my husband at all. Everyone says bad things happen if you swim in there. You start a good man, but there's so many ways it can go bad. Now let's welcome our panelists. Tanana Reeve Du, executive producer on the original documentary and writer for horror noir stories, Fugue State and the Lake. Stephen Barnes, writer on the stories, Fugue State and the Lake as well. Shernald Edwards, writer for the story, Brides Before You. And Victor Laval, writer of the story, Daddy. Welcome so much. Thank you for being here. I am so excited to talk to you all about this show, to talk to you about Black horror, I'm a huge fan, as many of you know, but I'm also a curious fan. I want to know everything, so let's jump right in. Tanana Reeb, I want to start with you, because I feel like Horror Noir, the documentary, felt extremely timely, and so does this one. But why is this the right time for a show like this to premiere? Well, this is a, a renaissance in Black horror. It's been building for some time, but absolutely with Jordan Peele's Get Out, that opened the gates for so many storytellers to finally have the light bulb go off in executives' minds. It's like, oh, right, Black horror. And there's an interest in it, and people are trying to cast it, but sometimes not getting it quite right. So I think that something like this, which is very, very carefully curated, it's by actual horror creators, and it's fulfilling the promise sort of at the end of the documentary that this is the Renaissance. And these are a variety of stories, so many of them actually adapted from literature, which is really important. That's one of the things I said at the Horror Noir premiere, the biggest gap with Black horror was adaptation. And so many movies are adaptations, why not our stories? <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with you. Um, as a writer, I know how <laughs> hard it is because I have attempted um, to not great results, but I have attempted to write horror. And it is a completely different beast, a completely different animal from anything else I've tried to do. Steven, can you tell me a little bit about how you approach writing in the horror genre? Well, the, first you have to define horror. And I would say that horror is literature whose primary focus is the production of a feeling of fear or dread in the audience. Mm -hmm. And so horror can overlap with any number of other genres, you know, science fiction, fantasy, westerns, you know, detective stories, anything you can think of, you know, the supernatural. So the primary thought is at the end of the story, how do I want people to feel? That's going to determine whether or not it's horror. So uh, there are times when there's a horror story with an upbeat ending. You want people to be, go on a roller coaster ride and come off saying, wow, you know, what an experience. Mm -hmm. Other times you, especially, if it's a sh if it's short stories in an anthology or an anthology program like this, you can actually have a down ending story because you know that the next story might might be up. It's going to be part of a of a flow. So you you've got you know you're you're playing music and some of the music has this kind of tonality and some has that kind of tonality. So once you determine what the feeling is going to be, then you sequence your sequences. You sequence the events, the scenes so that you are playing the emotions of the reader or the or the audience like you're playing a piano you know this kind of scene will produce this feeling this produces this feeling and you have to make sure that everything flows together so you've got that internal music so that's you know that's the my, my first thing if it's 
what is the intent of this? What do I want someone to feel? What do I want them to think? And then it's a matter of sequencing images and events to produce that. I think that's probably the best way I've ever heard that explained before in my entire life. And it's now making me feel like I should give it another shot, not give up on myself. No, you um, should not give up on yourself. You know, we need all the voices that we can get. We need every one of them because out of those voices will arise genius. I love that. And I, I hope, I hope that maybe I can meet that challenge at some point. Um, Tanana Reeve, I love when you were talking about that gap of adaptation. And I actually wanted to ask Chanel, how does the process go for you when seeking out stories to adapt? Um, I think those stories come from everywhere, you know, uh, having, being fortunate to be a, a working screenwriter in, in this industry, I, I realized what a lot of my colleagues on the panel are realizing now is that IP is a thing. Mm. IP is a driving thing now, and it's just like getting an original idea off the ground is challenging right now, which is in, in some ways unfortunate, but in, in other ways, it's giving a lot of uh, things that wouldn't necessarily get a platform like some of these short stories, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's helping those things. So um, the stories come from everywhere. I read novels, I read books of short stories, I comic books, um, just, just everywhere. And then, you know, I, I still like to think of, of life as an, as an IP. So there's a project that I'm in negotiations on right now that I'm super excited about uh, that will star Viola Davis. And, um, and that's adapted from the, the true life story of the first black female homicide cop in New Orleans. And, and I consider, it's hard for me to do a cop story right now, but I have very specific reasons why I can do this particular story. And it's because it is this black woman's story and what she did was extraordinary. And then how she, how she was treated after that was extraordinary as well. So I see that as an IP, people's lives are, 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 however I can extend the definition of IP so I can tell the story that I wanna tell is, is kind of how I approach it, if that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. And I'm gonna be waiting on that because that's, <laughs> um, that sounds amazing already. So I'm, I'm ready for that. Just drop, drop your girl a link uh, <laughs> when it's available. Um, Victor, as we're talking about stories, I would love to specifically talk about your story, Daddy. Uh, what was the inspiration behind that story? Uh, well, uh, being a dad was the inspiration behind being that <laughs> behind that story. And the uh, uh, how could I say, like when you care for anybody, it doesn't have to be a parent, right? But when you care for anybody, the push and pull between wanting to really care for them, protect them and all the rest. And the other part of you that can sometimes come up when you're exhausted, when you're overworked and you don't, you really don't wanna take care of them. You really wanna run the other way. You, so the best version of yourself versus the worst impulses in yourself uh, and how all of that is wrapped up in any one of us, particularly when we're thrown into a caretaking sort of role. That was like the, the heart of the story. And being included in the anthology, I'm gonna be so interested to see exactly which stories live around your story, because I feel like that's one of the coolest things about anthologies is like, even when the stories are separate, somehow in mm -hmm. some way, they're all working together. I wanted to ask you, Tanana Reeve, why do you think this format works so well with horror? because horror anthologies are usually my favorite. If there's an anthology of horror, sometimes for me, that's almost more important or better than like getting like a whole novel, almost. I would say that's not true with The Changeling. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in a lot of cases, that is the case. I love a horror anthology. Why? Why does it work so well? I think part of the reason horror anthologies work so well is the same reason short stories, period, work so well. I've been publishing mm -hmm. novels since 1995, but I still write short stories. Steve does. Victor obviously does. I encourage my writing students to write short stories because there's a real joy in creating a living, breathing character 
presenting the, the dilemma and sort of watching the character. For me, writing horror is all about watching people do smart, brave things, hopefully, <laughs> in the face of the unthinkable. Uh, sometimes they win, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're the monster and they don't know it, but it's it's a bite-sized story. And just from a practical standpoint, I don't always have two hours at the end of the day to sit and watch yeah. a movie. I could, I could watch like three horror movies a day if I had time, but I can watch three episodes in an anthology series or just one episode in an anthology series and you get that roller coaster ride, but it's a short roller coaster. <laughs> a shorter roller coaster for sure. I think maybe that's it. It's like, you know that somehow you're gonna get to a place where you're like, at least the stopping place is satisfying. Even if it's not the answer, even if it's not the final bit of the story, it's satisfying to stop at that place. That's my favorite thing about short stories. And Stephen, can I ask you, in terms of adapting something, how do you decide, and I'm thinking about short stories specifically because of you know how little material technically there is in a short story or can be. How do you decide how much of that original material to include and what to pay homage to? Well, the thing to remember is that on the page, you have the interior world of the character. You have you know, their thoughts and feelings and so forth. Where in a visual medium, all you have is what you see and what you hear. So I would start by reading the story a couple of times and then writing a synopsis of the story without looking at the page. And see, that's the stuff that really stuck with me. Okay. Then after I look at it, I might take a look back and say, did I forget anything that was important? Then I'd ask myself, what's the critical line? What are the things that we, that we have to know and experience in order to have that, that emotional experience at the end that I spoke about? And then in what mm -hmm. sequence do they need to be? It, there are stories that can be translated almost directly to the screen, but those are rare because those are generally going to be relatively trivial stories that are all on the surface because you don't have the interior monologues, you know, and, and you don't have a, a number of other things. The advantage that you have with film is that you have a number of different things happening at the same time. You can have somebody saying something at the same time somebody is acting at the same time something is moving in the background. At the same time, you have symbols in the scene that represent certain things at the same time the music is playing, the same time there are sound effects happening. So the fact that you can't do the things you do on the page, it's also true that you can't do on the page things you can do on the screen. So you have to, you, you have to ask, well, what is the dominant emotion? What is the theme? What's the thematics? What's the most important thing about this? And then how do I, how do I honor that in this different medium? Okay, And you have to do that with your own work. I think this is one of the reasons why sometimes people are not the best adapters of their own work because they're stuck on a particular way of doing it. That's what it was in their head. It's like you lived through a historical event and you're trying to write about that event, you know, say, no, it didn't happen that way, it happened this way. So if I'm coming in from the outside and I did, I don't have that same, that same attachment to it, what I wanna do is to honor it, is to, is to care about it, is to think, you know, is to treat it as gently as I would want someone to treat my own work, but also allow it to be its own creature. Shunnel, talk to me about the adaptation and the decisions you made around adapting Bride Before You. Yeah, it was it was really cool to hear, you know, what Steve just had to say because um, I didn't originate that story, and I, and I feel like even though it's brand new, it feels like it's beloved, and I'm not sure where I'm getting that energy from. Maybe Tanana Reeve, I got that from you in in our in our first meeting, but. Um, I was just so struck by the the poetry of it and and the beauty of it, um, and it's not the first time that I've adapted something, so so that's good. But I have sometimes I have a reverence for the material that gets in the way of the adaptation, and I had to you know, um, and I and I had to make some hard decisions in the adaptation of this story because the story itself I don't want to give too much away for people like me who love a who hate a spoiler and love all the surprises. But the, the story itself has a very specific point of view, which I couldn't do for, for screen. Um, and, you know, like for affordability and for, for storytelling and just, you know, the, the, the point of view of that particular character. It's just like, how did, this is a movie. I, I mean, I want to make it a movie anyway, but, you know, it's just like, I don't know how I would do that in 20 minutes. So I changed the, the POV. So what I'm desperately hoping is that people aren't vexed 
you know, there's my Trini, my Trinidadian that's coming out is that people aren't vexed with me for doing that because I think what I'm doing, I think what I'm doing, I'm actually looking at my final draft file, like over here, it's just like final drafts looking at me like, why are you talking about this when you haven't finished it yet? But <laughs> is that what you're doing? Good, good to know. You have pages. Um, but just the, the idea that I had to make a, a decision on point of view, and then I had to look at what it was that, that drew me to it and what drew me to it, um, for those who are familiar with story and who, and those are aren't, is that I see it's a, it's a very strong statement on colorism and how specifically how dark chocolate women are treated in, uh, by society, by the black community and then by their own families. And so that's at the heart of the thing for me. And, and it's really neat for me to hear Victor talk about the, the themes of parents and, and caretaking and that, because that's also a very strong theme for me in, in this. And I think, you know, I've come up with this ending image, which was one of the first things that came to me from just, again, I don't want to give too much away, but I have this, it's gnarly, it's gnarly, but it's also to me hopeful. So hearing Tanana Reeve say what she said earlier too, it's 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 what I it's what I hoped for the character. And I remember when I pitched it to AMC and Shutter, I was just like, and then I want this to happen. And they're like, great. And I was like, sweet. <laughs> because this is the thing I really wanted to do. I was like, y'all, don't you, isn't that crazy? They're like, yes, it is crazy. And we love it. So I started with that ending image and and, and I built it out from from there, but it, it was really a, a time, and, I'm, and it's also a historical piece. So I find myself you know, in the way that writers, sometimes we distract ourselves. It's just like, I gotta do some research. You know, I gotta find out exactly what the thing was where. It's just like, no, you can't really stop wasting your time when you should be doing pages. But I also mm -hmm. need to situate that in my head. I just feel, I think ultimately this has turned into a very long answer and I apologize, but okay. I, I have such a reverence for the material, for the historical placement of it for for how beautiful I, I I think it is that it's all it's a push pull for me what I can include and what I can't and um and and what's important and what should come to the fore and what needs to be ground everything needs to be grounded so there's a lot that goes into it and I just I hope that I I do the writer proud the writer of the original story oh and that's a great transition because I want to shout out Stephanie Malia Morris who wrote that original short story she hasn't published that much so I'm just so vicariously excited for her what a way to start a career that huh? it didn't yeah, really. take her 30 years to get it adapted <laughs> I, I hate her she's, no. she's too good, good for her. Good for her. <laughs> one of the things that we don't often get to are, are privy to is what the author intended and and you asked about IP earlier, and and often we don't know what the author intended. And there's a um, an interview with with Stephanie Malia Morris and and how the story started and what she was inspired by, and the things that she thought that uh, that the audience would take from it. I was like, oh, that's different. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's totally different than what I was attracted to as a reader and as a writer. But I'm hoping that I captured the essence of. Um of of all of that and uh and that i do the story justice victor as a writer um and one of my favorite writers in the genre and writers of fiction period um i'm wondering what examples of black horror because we're learning so much about these different horror writers one of my favorite things about this show is that you all are going to be adapting stories that have been around for a long time some new and some that have been around for a while what examples of black horror have you drawn from in your own writing Victor because I always wonder that about it well you know I'm thinking specifically about the episode for horror noir um if I could say like the sort of the energy that I was taking uh, the most from as far as like uh, how to uh, embody Red, the main character and like his experience. Uh, this may sound strange, but it was uh, the brother from another planet, uh, sci-fi, but I still feel like to Stephen's point earlier, it falls under the umbrella. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I think one of the things that I found so remarkable about that movie and still do is how much um, vulnerability Joe Morton brought to that role right, and did it without being able to explain himself, right, but somehow came, came across in a way that I feel like even today, uh, uh, Black actors don't get a chance to do 
all that much, right? Where they just get to be vulnerable, not because they're tortured or because they're uh, under attack exclusively, but vulnerable because they are human mm -hmm. and because they're scared and overwhelmed and, and because they're beautiful and tender and you know all those things. And so, I mean, just specifically thinking about uh, in the sort of one for one, when I was thinking about, you know, like you say, like, how do I embody this main character? I kept trying to remind myself for all the places where this will go, I would love it if at heart, you would always want to sort of hold him close the way certainly whenever I watch Brother From Another Planet, I want to protect him, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that that strikes me as a, a an aspect uh, for Black characters on film or in TV that you don't get to see that much. Um, just to say like, this is just a person with, this is like with a big heart, tender skin, and they deserve to be protected and loved, but unfortunately they aren't always, mm. you know? So that was like one in particular that I could think of for this. I love that. I love, and I love, I love Brother from Another Planet personally. Mm -hmm. I don't know about everybody else, but for me, that's a, that's a huge one. Um, Tanana Reed, we know you were an executive producer of the documentary, Poor Noir. Uh, and you are also obviously working on this version of Horror Noir, which we're going to show everybody a clip of in a moment. But before doing so, can you tell me a little bit about what distinguishes the anthology from the documentary? I love that question because there, may, there are probably people out there who haven't seen uh, Horror Noir, a, a history of Black horror which I have to shout out the director, Xavier uh, Bergen, and also um, Ashley Blackwell, um, and Danielle Burroughs, and Phil Nobil Jr., and Kelly uh, Ryan, and, and the book by Dr. Robin Armines Coleman, it's the history of how Blackness has been used in the history of cinema in horror. So it's all those tropes, uh, the first to die, the sacrificial mm -hmm. Negro, uh, the spiritual guide, you know, all these tropes that because we loved horror, we would watch it, but we're wincing when we see Scatman Crowthers get that ax through his chest in The Shining. Like, what? That wasn't in the book? What's up? So that's the documentary. It's kind of this, frankly, not so happy history. There were some uh, artists who were able to work through that and shine, like Casey Lemons with Eve's Bayou and Rusty Cundiff with Tales from the Hood. Um, some that were a little uh, off mark, like the original Candyman, <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. were Blacks in horror. So this um, series, this new anthology, is looking forward instead of looking backward, would be the easiest way to put it. This is sort of the promise of what happens when you let Black creators have more control, you let Black creators in the room, you let us pitch our stories. It's not just, oh, let's take this white script and put a Black actor in the part voila, black horror. No, because <laughs> sometimes that's just highly problematic. You can't pretend race doesn't exist. Now, black horror doesn't always have to be about race. Sometimes it's just uh, about addressing invisibility. Hey, you know, like Victor was saying, we love, we hurt, tell our stories too. But sometimes it is racism is the monster. Um, and, and, and as black artists, this is just an amazing opportunity for us to, to showcase what we're capable of producing moving away from the tropes of yesteryear. Let's watch the clip. There's less and less of this, oh, well, Black people don't like, watch, or make horror films. I think that's my conversation that's becoming um, obsolete. A part of the work that I do that I love doing is I get to talk to these um, new and up and coming filmmakers who are making these really fun and funny, but also scary and introspective films. Just so many up and coming a talent out there that's, you know, that's pretty exciting and it gives, gives me hope <laughs> for the future mm -hmm. that we're... And we'll help each other and yeah, change the game. We just need to all get in the door. You know, there's so many stories and so many genres that we belong to. I've just asked so many people, like, say, I got a horror film, I got a horror film, I got a horror film. <laughs> and this is way before Get Out. Mm -hmm. And now maybe they'll get a chance to actually get that out to the public. These are stories by Black creators for Black viewers. If whites want to enjoy it, fine. 
but it's not about them, right? It's about us. <laughs> I think the entire film industry are ready for us to open up the doors. Just seeing black heroes and, and leads on screen, the next generation won't think, oh, that's, that's weird. They, I mean, they think, oh, that's perfectly normal to have the black lead, the black person save the day. If we can use what we've, we've experienced, we can tell stories that people have never seen before. So that's what I'm excited to see coming. There's a draw and a connection there um, in the minority experience for these horror films. The, the industry realized, oh yeah, white people will see movies uh, about non-white people. They will, they'll see, you just have to make them. Can you talk to me a little bit about what it's like working with your wife Tanana Reeve do? Yeah, I mean, we when we first got married, we understood the implications of being able to work together. So we actually created a set of rules. Uh, one of them is that the, the, the relationship itself is never at stake. That in order, to, you know, if, if an, a writer will argue with themselves about what they're going to put on the page. So if you're working with another person, you have to feel free to be free to argue. You have to be free to fight. It's like, you know, you've got your perspective. That's right. And it's going to be uh, 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 sometime. So we have to make sure we kiss goodnight every night you know, and we let as much of it go as possible by the morning. You know, and we've never we've never held it for terribly long. But another rule is that one or the other of us always has to take lead on the story. It's something I learned in other collaborations. Somebody is driving the car. The other person is the passenger, or they're riding shotgun or whatever. Um, and the, the, the driver has the responsibility of listening carefully, but in general, the driver will be the person who either wrote the original piece of property or that this particular work for one reason or another is most simpatico with their particular perspectives and skills and experience. So you can always tell which one of us took lead by whose name comes first. You know, if Tanana Reeve was, was the lead, then it's by Tanana Reeve Dew and Stephen Barnes. If I took lead, it's by Stephen Barnes and Tanana Reeve Dew. Um, aside from that, you know, it's, it really is, you know, a catch as catch can. We work in, in shared space like Google Docs or um, Writer Duet, which is a great shared space, you know, screenwriting software. And we, but we create the outline together and then one of the other of us will take lead. You know, we both love writing. And so it's it's an honor and fun. And there's never a matter of, oh God, you do, I'm so glad you're gonna have to do this. Even if there are if our difficulties, this is the life that we asked for. We're actually living the life that both of the children inside us wanted. So it behooves us to create a safe play space. Uh, and uh, the only thing I would add on top of that is that I try to never forget that it is my honor to be protective of her little girl. You know, and so if I if, if that's if that's my only function, and there have been times when you know it was it's just her project, and she, and I'm there basically just just to just to protect her, in in that sense. And if that's what it is, then that's a wonderful thing. That's a beautiful thing. How dare y'all? Uh, <laughs> no, I really, okay. I really love this lady. She's wonderful. <laughs> that makes me so happy. I mean, you can tell, but it's just it's great to hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so cute. I can't yes. take it. <laughs> Chenault. <laughs> Chenault. Okay. Um, let's talk about the fact that you've said you are not a typical horror fan, but something drew you to the opportunity to adapt this story. What was it? Yeah, I I will say I'm not I'm not a traditional horror fan because I know that there are mm -hmm. folks out there who love the genre so much they will just watch everything take it in you watch that you strap in you pray it's good you know you pray mm -hmm. it's not going to insult your your heart or, or your spirit and you and but I don't do that to myself when it comes to horror I do that to myself when it comes to like almost anything with a black lady in it you know just like right. is there one of us all right I'll watch it let's just see can you just give me something just anything um but uh but when I heard horror and and also, I feel like my my life as a black woman, uh, especially right now, is a waking horror movie. You know, every time I hear cops circling in the, the chapters outside my my window, I stop. You know, I'm always looking around the corners, like, is there a patrol car? Am I going to be able to walk around this corner? Am I going to get home? Or is, or is my family going to get home? 
So when I seek, and again, it was it was really powerful to hear Steve define the genre. If I seek out watching something where I'm going to, and I know I'm going to be tense and scared and on edge, then I'm very careful about what it is. Um, so, but when I heard horror noir, well, I knew the documentary. I watched the documentary because I had started to to plumb those parts of my life where I just thought, oh, that's just Tuesday. And I, you know, I tell my fella something and he has this completely different experience. He's a white dude, so he has completely different experience. And I'd be like, this happened when I was a kid. I stayed with my grandmother for a summer in Brooklyn. It was really hot and she wouldn't turn on the air conditioner. And she fed me toaster pancakes and didn't know what to do with me and wouldn't let me go in the basement. And he was like, that's a horror movie. And I was like, no, that was just 85. <laughs> you know, so now I'm realizing that there's so much of my life that can lend itself to this kind of storytelling that I got really excited about. So I started doing a bunch of research. I started reading. I read a bunch of stuff from Tanana Reeve, you know, Tanana Reeve, I read Patient Zero. That really affected me. And and Victor, I've read, you know, The Ballad of Black Tom twice. Oh, and the, wow. the first time I read it, I was in like a legally weed, uh, legal weed <laughs> induced haze and i was just like was that as good as i remembered i went back and i read it again and i was like jesus you know and i just got really so i'm just so thrilled to be here but um i just got really inspired and i was just like oh i can do this is one of those things that i don't just need to write what i've been writing i can mm-hmm. recall my genre roots and my love of horror that came from my grandfather you know and i don't know what it is about black folks and horror we've been through a lot so I guess you know when it's when it's elevated, there's there's joy in and there's joy in the fear as long as it's not right outside your door. Um, so I was attracted to the title horror noir, and I watched the documentary, and I was doing a bunch of reading, and then I heard about who was on the list, and then I got the story, and I just felt so lucky. I was just like, this has to be, this ha- I had to, I had to be a part of it. And then in the last year and a half or so, I've watched almost every single black horror thing that I can get my hands on and read and, and then some, and it's been illuminating. That one last question, I wanna ask Victor how you became involved in this project, which I'm guessing that somebody sent you a fruit basket, champagne, okay? <laughs> No, well, I had a, 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 a project, a different project that I was working on with AMC and uh, one of the execs there, I wanna shout her out, Crystal Holt, uh, um, she basically said like, look, we're doing this as well. And, uh, I know you love horror. I think this could be a good, uh, move. Do you have anything that you would want to adapt honestly? And so I just sent her like three things. And then <clears throat> the only one she said, like, look, the only one that the budget could allow <laughs> is this one. And I said, uh, I would be ama- I would be so happy if. I could do that if if I could do that work. And she said, "Then come on board." And she same as uh, Chanel was just saying. I, she told me who else was already kind of coming to the party, and I said, "Like, uh, if you'll have me, uh, I promise not to make too much of a mess." I love it. This is a dream panel. This is a dream show. Thank you all so much for the hard work that you've put into it. I'm a huge fan. I can't wait for everybody to get their eyeballs on it. I can't wait for this to happen. It's going to be amazing. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this conversation. And thanks for watching our Horror Noir panel at Comic Con at Home 2021. Don't miss Horror Noir streaming October 14th on Shudder and AMC+. Plus.